Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm not talking too much about Kilt. Kilt is basically providing decentralized identity and giving back sovereignty uh, of their identities to the user, but not only to users, but of course also to things like in the IoT business. And today we're talking about DeFi regulation and DAXs, opportunity or threat. Uh, so. Um, you might have noticed or heard uh, that there's a lot of regulation coming. Um, and some of the DAXs actually came, or quite a lot of DAXs actually came up in the last couple of months and uh, were a little bit worried about what they should actually do and asked us if we could possibly help. So what's actually happening is that decentralized exchanges and other DeFi protocols will be pushed to identify their users because regulator regulators want that. And so the basic thing that you can do if you are a DEX, you can go either totally decentralized because then you're not a company and no one can actually regulate you and no one's going to try to regulate you because you are not existent, you're just something in the internet. Or if you are a little bit centralized, you have to go the way to be regulated. And this is what the DEXs have to understand now. There's two ways that they can go. So now everyone could say, well, let's just go decentralized and don't care about it. <coughs> but actually, there's uh, quite a good reason for a DEX to be a bit centralized. Not only that it is more convenient for the users, uh, but also there's a lot of money coming in to the space when, it is gets, uh, when it's getting regulated because uh, the crypto market is now something like two, two trillion or so. Um, and when you look at the finance market overall, uh, this is much, much bigger, right? So uh, why is the crypto market so relatively small? It is because it's not regulated and because the big funds can't put their money in because they have to um, comply to some standards which the crypto market doesn't have. And if the crypto market gets those standards, then there's huge um, funds probably going to flow into the market. So that could actually open regulated finance world for the crypto sector. So it's a complicated decision for a decentralized finance project to either be regulated or be fully decentralized. So, and so now what we're trying to uh, solve now um, is that actually the DEXs, they are used to not knowing their customer. This is part of their story. They don't want to know their customer. And now regulators come and say, you have to know your customer. And this is a little bit problematic for those guys because normally they don't even store data. They don't have servers and they don't want to copy the problem that we had in normal finance, that huge data silos are emerging uh, with lots of personal data where you have to take care of, where you have to comply to things like the GDPR and stuff like that. People, uh, the, the DEXs, the decentralized finance, don't want to store data. So how can we do that? Um, what we suggest is that they would partner with trusted KYC provider, which are also in a regulated infrastructure, and use an infrastructure like Kilt to get rid of the data. An institution or an individual could then share um, an element with the, of their identity with the DEX, and the DEX would not establish a, a, a centralized data store, avoiding privacy issues and stuff like that. So, if we would do something like that, that would actually be a win-win-win-win situation uh, because it would be less work for the DEX because they don't have to buy all the centralized servers and make all the security measures around them. Um, uh, it, the customers could be more confident. The regulators would, in the end, be satisfied. And uh, it's also an additional business opportunity for the KYC providers. Um, so let's first talk a little bit when, to understand how that works. Let's talk a little bit about what is digital identity. Um, identity always consists of two things. It's always an identifier and credentials. Uh, think of your identity. Your identity is basically first an identifier. That would be, for example, your face or your fingerprint or something which is totally decentralized because no government or institution ever gave your face to you. You made it yourself. Um, and then a copy 
or a picture of this face is put on different credentials. Look, it's like, for example, your passport or um, <clears throat> your driver's license or something. And those credentials, they represent a power, a right, a duty or something that you have, and they are issued by a trusted entity, and they are linked to you by having a picture of your face by linking to your identifier. So when you talk about identity, it's always two things. It's credentials, like passports, and it's an identifier, like your face. Those two things are always needed when you have identity. When we talk about digital identity, this is a little bit more complicated because your face is not in the internet. So first, we have to build a decentralized identifier. And there's a standard for that that's called decentralized identifiers, DIDs. And that's a set of key pairs which is lo generated locally on your device. That mean, means no one's giving it to you. You create your identity yourself like you created your face yourself. And the private key always remains with you, of course. And the public uh, key can be stored and anchored on a public blockchain, for example, the Kill blockchain. To get, and together with additional information in a DID document. So what the Kill blockchain basically does, it stores the DID documents which belong to your decentralized identifier. This DID document can easily be retrieved. I'm going to show you on the next slide how that works. And yeah, let's just show it. Um, so here we have the user creating, for example, in the Sporon wallet, uh, their own DID. They put it on the kill blockchain and then can, it be, and then can be accessed by, through many ways. So for once, there's the universal resolver, which is the touch point for people who are completely outside blockchain. So this is just a web socket where, where you can get the DID documents. If you are, if that could be a DEX, probably not, but maybe that would be rather a centralized exchange or something, or a bank. <coughs> Um, a DEX, which is connected to the Polkadot ecosystem, by the way, we're part of the Polkadot ecosystem, um, uh, can either go directly on the Kill blockchain, because we all have the SR25519 keys, um, or it can use the Polkadot mechanisms like XCM to access the DID document here. But there are also bridges in Polkadot, for example, to the Ethereum blockchain. So if the DEX lives on the Ethereum blockchain, it can also query the data from there through the bridge, through the Polkadot, directly from Kilt. So basically, everyone can access those DID documents. Still, the, DID, the key of the DID resides here with the user and is never shared to, with anyone. So what can we do with it? Next, any third-party application can send messages to a user Sporan wallet, and the user can decide to sign this message with the DID, making sure that exactly this DID has signed this message. So th this is imp an important and easy feature uh, where you can basically have uh, do any kind of proof that you are the one owning this DID. How does that work? For example, here we have an Ethereum decentralized application. It sends a transaction to the user and says, do you want to sign this transaction? Then the user looks at the transaction and says, yeah, I want to sign it, signs it with a DID, and then sends it back to the Ethereum DAP. And that can then store the signed transaction and the DID which signed it on the Ethereum blockchain. Now, I have the proof on the Ethereum blockchain that actually this user, not knowing who this user is, but exactly this user has signed this transaction. That's basically the first step. Now let's do this a little bit more complicated and add verifiable credentials to it. Right now we have only the face, right? This face signed this thing. Doesn't say a lot and is not enough for regulators, definitely. So the user can also ask a trusted entity to issue verifiable credentials to their DID and then they're linked electronically to this DID. The trusted entity would sign a verifi the fi verifiable credential with, the, with their DID and then send it to the user. The user stores the verifiable uh, credential locally, so it's not somewhere out there in the internet where everybody can look at it. It is locally on the computer of the user. 
And then the user may decide to show it to someone, just like you, show, uh, you decide who you show your passport or your driver's license to. You're not exhibiting it somewhere so that everybody can look at it. Somebody asks you for your driver's license, and then you decide if you show it, right? So this is the same mechanism. So that could also work with a DAX. So what's happening in the verifiable credential case? Um, First, we all anchor our DID here. The KYC provider anchors its DID. The user anchors the DID. And then the user claims at the KYC provider, please, can you do a KYC process with me, like checking my passport and stuff like that. You all have done that 100 times. And then this KYC provider would issue um, the verifiable credential to the user. And then the verifiable credential is stored here. And any time that the user has asked for a KYC credential, they can now say, yeah, here it is. We don't have to go again to the next KYC provider and get this thing done again. You have it once, and you can use it multiple times for multiple purposes. So, and when you have this, then you can actually go to the next step and say, how do we use that uh, with the DEX? So first, we. We, we start at the DEX and you want to do something, maybe a big transaction in this decentralized exchange. Then the DEX sends this transaction to you for signing. So you sign it with your DID, but you also send your KYC verifiable credential with it, also signed with your DID. Now the DEX can look at this message and find out, A, have you signed it? B, is this verifiable credential I need for KYC in there. Is it issued by a KYC provider, which I trust? This is just a trust relationship here, the dotted line. It's not something electronic. And if they trust the KYC provider, they can check on the killed blockchain if this verifiable credential is actually valid. And if, is it valid? if it is valid, then they can actually take this and execute the transaction and store the link to it on the Ethereum blockchain, for example. So what you have now is that the DEX, which can compute but, can, but can't store or don't want to store, so they can find out if the verifiable credential and the DEX actually match each other, if, the, if it is signed by a trusted entity, and store it on the blockchain and then immediately forget about the transaction. So they don't have to store anything because everything is already on chain. Because now, last step, when an authority should ever be really interested in this particular transaction, then they can look it up on the Ethereum blockchain, and they can see which KYC provider actually signed this thing, and they see the DID of the person who did the transaction. And then they can ask the KYC provider in the end to disclose the information about this user the DEX is not involved in this whole thing because they can prove that they did everything right and the KYC provider has to store the data of the users anyway. So this is basically how you solve this problem. The DEXs don't have to store anything. People who have to store it anyway are used for this service. That was basically what I had to say. We have, thank you. I think we have four and a half more minutes if you have questions. Yes, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. Let's put it over to the floor if anybody does have any questions. My man, let me get right over to you. Hi. Um, so my question is, where do ZKPs come into this equation in terms of being able to kind of remain entirely private, verifying identity without relying on a central party. So maybe having trusted parties in the first place, but when you're abstracting this, just using ZKPs as zero knowledge proofs. Yeah, so zero knowledge proofs, um, we work together with a partner company which uh, provides zero knowledge proofs on top of Kilt, so this is possible. So but the thing with zero knowledge proofs is normally it's not exact information. So zero knowledge proof would be used, for example, in the situation where you uh, want to go into a bar and you want to provide the information that you're over 18, but you don't want to provide your birth date, 
right? So you could actually have an application which does a zero knowledge proof on what is inside the credential without sharing the credential itself, but sh uh, just sh sharing information which derives out of the credential. That's possible. Yeah, clear. Any other questions this morning? Let me get to uh, this gentleman over here. How are you doing this morning? You well? Hi. So, whoa, that's loud. Um, so, so with the verifiable credentials, they'll they'll be verifiable, but sometimes they'll be fake or synthetic identities. And so, is there a thought about what happens if a particular DEX has a lot of transactions that are happening, and a lot of those credentials turn out to be synthetic identities as opposed to real people? Yeah, well, if that happens, then they would probably not have the... So they, there's two lines of security in there, right? First, the DEX. Okay, if the DEX is criminal in a way, um, then how would they get the verifiable credential? So because the verifiable credential is signed uh, by the KYC provider here, right? And say, so you need a criminal KYC provider plus a criminal uh, user uh, plus a criminal DEX. Okay, then you can basically do something, uh, but it's getting harder and harder because this trusted entity KYC provider would probably not be so trusted after a while if that turns out, and then they would probably lose all of their business because no one would ever pay them for providing KYC credentials anymore. Any other questions? Right beside me, how are you? Great. Um, Quick question. So you're part of the Polkadot ecosystem. Does that mean you function on a parachain or parathread kind of system, or? Yes, we uh, are uh, right now. We are on the Kusama network. We won, I think, slot number six of the parachains a month ago, um, and are happy parachaining, producing blocks. Got it. Anybody else, sir? Uh, so sorry. Uh, with. Decentralized exchanges is the current regulatory risk. And okay, can you speak a bit louder? With the decentralized exchanges, yes. there's the currently identified regulatory risk, and then there's all of the future potential changes which might be kind of grandfathered onto those previously operating. So one part of decentralization is they s a lot of DEX operators try to stay anonymous the whole process, right? The people that produce the D app, they try and stay anonymous the entire way through to protect against future regulatory risk. In this relationship with the KYC provider, do they have to de-anonymize themselves to the KYC provider and your architecture, thus kind of breaking away already from the perhaps decentralized goal that they might have? Yeah, well, so first of all, you can be totally de decentralized if you want to be totally decentralized. If you choose to work together with KYC providers, you will have to make your own assessment uh, which KYC providers are um, okay with the regulators in the particular jurisdiction you're in. You probably is totally, completely different from, from Asia to the US uh, to, uh, to Britain, right? So uh, it, it will be different ones. So um, I don't see one KYC provider getting the whole um, market here because there's hundreds of them out there and they all have their legal papers which, uh, with uh, some jurisdictions. So um, I, d I don't see a, a lot of centralization there. Of course, it's not decentralized anymore totally, right? But uh, this is sometimes the price we have to pay. <laughs> so.